and welcome to Video Game Hangover. I'm Randy Dickinson, and I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hey, I'm DJ Ross. I'm in Mountain View, California. Each week on Video Game Hangover, we talk about the games that have been keeping us up at night. This week, we're playing Gears of War 5, Anodyne, and Wide Ocean Big Jacket. Oh. Oh. Should be more excited. These are exciting (laughs) games, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. It is a... Um, it's a, it's an interesting collection of games. It is. We like variety. We are variety gamers here. At, at, <laughs> at, where are we? Where are we? Video game hangover. We are variety gamers. If anything, we are variety gamers. Mm-hmm. I recently learned what a variety streamer was. So, oh, I've, what, I've what is a variety that. streamer? <laughs> it's, well, apparently there are streamers. There are people who make their living streaming a single game. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy only streams Fortnite. This lady only streams Call of Duty. Uh, and then there are people who mix it up, who do a little bit of everything. Those are variety streamers. Okay, that sounds about right. I think I'm more of a, a variety streamer kind of person. I don't know if sure. I... Uh, I mean, I, I only watch a handful of streamers, but I don't think any of them are always playing the exact same thing every time. Yeah. You do have a lot of games that you play consistently. Uh, I do? You do, I think. Uh, somewhat, I guess. Yeah. Final Fantasy. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Oh, am I a variety <laughs> streamer? Is that what you're getting at? Well, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I suppose. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, that's definitely true. I mean, you don't get online every every night for three hours and just stream. <laughs> no. Final Fantasy. No. What's I actually, up, guys? Yeah. I haven't streamed. Uh, I mean, I don't stream as often as I used to. But even when I do stream, I don't think I've streamed Final Fantasy in years, just because. I don't know. I don't typically do like the super hardcore in game stuff in that, which I feel like is most of the streams out there. It's like, I feel like that's what people want to watch. That's what people want to see. Yeah. Yeah. So if I stream to just be like, hey, I'm, hey guys, I'm painting my house again. <laughs> Look, looks pretty good, I think. <laughs> I'm going to knit some gloves today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Making some soup. Took a real long time to get all the ingredients together, but now we're doing it. <laughs> could have starved to death in the time it took to get the ingredients to make this soup <laughs> uh, excellent so you know i try and do other things yeah and i really only stream once a year for um <laughs> for um child's play nope what's it called extra life extra life but um, when you do you stream many things not just one i, I am a variety hours. streamer on that singular day correct nice okay yep why are you talking about variety streamers? Were you, uh... I don't know what the context was. I'm not sure. I read it somewhere um, with regards to somebody saying something on a stream that they were not supposed to say. Uh, and Ooh. this created a lot of fallout for them. And then it described them in sort of like, this person has this many followers. It is generally regarded as a variety streamer. And I went, what is that? <laughs> uh, so I had to Google it and um, was led to that bit of information. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Learning stuff. <laughs> learning things during my quarantine period yeah. school is in session you're not watching a lot of a lot of twitch while you're in quarantine i am not i'm not watching any twitch i've uh none no. none. none i find myself at time because like i don't watch a lot of tv just like regular broadcast tv or whatever mm-hmm. but i do watch twitch occasionally and especially since all this started uh i feel like people have been streaming more so sometimes i find myself thinking like man the like the streams that i do watch are not on right now <laughs> what is on what, yeah. what are people playing out there hmm yeah i don't know i um uh, over the weekend they had that big televised stay at home concert to raise money for um you know uh, uh what you call it frontline workers and things like that and it mm-hmm. was um a bunch of different artists broadcasting from their palatial estates um uh, and uh it was like you know simultaneously being broadcast on nbc abc fox and twitch and i went what hmm. <laughs> really is twitch a variety uh, like a uh what a viable stream for consumption of just generic entertainment can i watch lady gaga play the piano from her <laughs> house on twitch that would be unusual i wonder what kind of numbers it did i wonder uh, like probably didn't do better than fortnite yeah, I wonder if if more people were tuning into somebody playing Fortnite, then yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's hard for me to keep up with those kinds of things. It was so funny to me, like a couple of years ago, uh, or however long this was, uh, when they finally got the like Evo Finals on ESPN. Yeah, 
uh, and they were like, finally, like esports have arrived. Uh, and then they posted the numbers from uh, that viewing, and it was just like, well, like we we'll get these kind of numbers on Twitch all the time. Well, maybe not like ESPN <laughs> numbers, but like a significant yeah. number of people are just like playing Street Fighter or, you know, insert your game of choice on Twitch just daily. Yeah. ESPN would kill for those numbers right now. <laughs> There's not a whole yeah, lot yeah, else for them true. to broadcast at this point. So, yeah. Just empty I stadiums. The, um, the world, it was a rebroadcast, but it was the world championship of Tetris on ESPN one time. I was nice. clicking through channels and I'm not inclined to generally stop at ESPN. And I'm like, what? Tetris is on ESPN? <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was people playing Tetris very aggressively at each other. And I was like, oh shit, I'm going to watch the hell out of this. Nice. Um, it was very exciting. That's been a while since I play a little of that Tetris 99. Uh, I, I just saw that they're doing a a ring fit themed uh what, what do they call it the tetris maximus tournament oh yeah uh and i was like that's a weird combination of things but how sure. is it ring fit themed i think there's just like you know in the past tournaments if you score enough points you get a uh a specialized theme to use while you're playing tetris 99 so oh, like was, skin the game yeah, yeah yeah this one i assume it plays uh some of the ring fit soundtrack which is it's actually a pretty good soundtrack i yeah, maybe i wouldn't mind having that while i play tetris 99 mm-hmm. Hmm. maybe the little ring guy would pop up and be like do a t-spin here put the block this way that's how you do it <laughs> work harder <laughs> <laughs> that's what i need training in. i don't know how to do that yep get moving fatty hmm. Hmm. Hurt- hurtful hurtful ring <laughs> <laughs> just trying to help cut me deep um yeah anyway still still just hanging out enjoying life in quarantine yeah I have been watching a lot of television. I've been doing a lot of Hulu, a lot of Netflix. <laughs> yeah, a lot of sort of video game sampling too, just sort of uh, working my way through kind of anything that kind of appeals to me. Um, yeah, I got I got more games than I know what to do with at this point. More hours of pointless entertainment in my life to fill my days. <laughs> uh, none of it's pointless anymore. It's all just like, <laughs> how do I get through the next 24 hours? <laughs> what movie all... can I throw on in the, in the, the interest day? of, yeah preserving my sanity and keeping me grounded for at least two hours at a clip yeah hmm. i have uh i feel like for the last few weeks i have just been like staring down a bunch of 60 to 80 hour games and just not wanting to fully commit to any of them <laughs> uh, yeah so i've been kind of hopping around uh but i think i have a plan uh but i'll get into that next week okay all right so no 80 hour games this week but uh, maybe soon we'll see all right, good. What did you uh, jump into this week? I know you, um, you've you been playing this game, Anodyne, which I know very little about. We both played Wide, Asia, uh, Wide Ocean Big Jacket, um, and I've been playing kind of a ridiculous amount of Gears of War. Yeah. Um, um, you want to start with Anodyne? Sure. Okay, because I'm super into it. I just got into this actually just a few days ago. It's not a very long game. Uh, but it came very highly recommended. And I had like, it's one of those games, one of those indie games where you've like, I've kind of heard of it. I like know what it looks like, but I've never really played it. It's like, I don't know what the deal with that game is, but uh, <laughs> had a very strong recommendation. It just came out on the Switch like a year ago, uh, even though the actual game, I think is quite old. I think it came out originally in like 2013. But uh, thanks to the Switch, just making everything new and relevant again. I was like, oh, it's time to check this out. So I did, and it has been great. I have just been completely loving it. Oh, cool. It is a little tough to describe starting out. I guess it's very similar uh, to like a classic uh, top-down Zelda game. Go on. <laughs> Go on, yes, yes. <laughs> it starts out in a very weird way, which, uh, and this is very emblematic of like how the rest of the game goes, where... Uh, some character just begins speaking uh and you realize that they are just it sounds like they're speaking to you because they're just like uh like get up and use the d-pad to move yourself around like you use the d-pad and now you push the a button to do this thing and it's like oh this is strange i'm not used to this happening in a video game Mm -hmm. um and then it opens up and it's just i forget where (laughs) actually the opening scene is at this point but it it the game is basically just weird, surreal scene, like just back to back. You start out in um, a very weird place, which kind of looks like 
Actually, I, I may have mixed the order up. You either start out in some sort of weird, like, interdimensional nexus or something. You're kind of like on platforms floating in space. But then um, very shortly after that, or very shortly before that, because my memory isn't working this evening, you were just on some some area that looks like city streets, like modern city streets. Um, mm -hmm. And then you just kind of like navigate through these these rooms like you would in a Zelda game. And it's very, like, very confusing. It's not, it wasn't quite so easy to just figure out what the deal with this game is. So is it uh, sort of in the sen in the in the sense of comparing it to Zelda, kind of wandering around villages, talking to players, getting mm, missions or objectives and things like that, or or is it a little more esoteric and harder to suss out? Um, I'd say it's like structurally, it's very much like a, a Zelda game where you are just moving around maps uh, top down. Occasionally, you'll talk to an NPC or somebody who will give you like very vague hints of what to do the uh the story is like there's a very generic threat of like the darkness that is threatening to like destroy the world or corrupt some piece of the world and uh, <laughs> even though i've been playing it for a while it's not totally clear to me if the plot is going anywhere or if it's just kind of this <laughs> weird excuse to send you on this journey through these weird surreal environments uh but i'm kind of okay with it um it feels a lot like uh just like tonally a little bit like the more the the stranger and more uncomfortable sections of earthbound where you would just be in like a cave or something and there'd be not really any music playing just like these strange sort of theremin noises in the background uh and occasionally some character would say something that sounds very ominous and like <laughs> you know i don't know anxiety inducing but it's like <laughs> the atmosphere in this is sort of like that throughout most of the game or at least most of the first half of the game because in a lot of the the environments it looks kind of like just a very um I mean, it looks like a top-down 2d zelda game but the colors are very muted it feels vaguely like post-apocalyptic and a little grim uh aside from just this threat of uh, the generic darkness approaching mm -hmm. um and I feel like it also, like, kind of subverts a lot of your expectations uh, if you think of it as a Zelda game. Because you, the first thing you do is you go, um, you're kind of wandering around, and you get, uh, you, like, oh, I need a weapon or something, right? Because you can't even do anything at the start. And what you end up finding is a broom. Uh, and then you just end up whacking things with his broom, like <laughs> how Link was swinging a sword, but he's just, uh, the, the guy in this game is just hitting stuff with a broom. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's like, you just have a broom and that is your weapon. You never, at least um, up to the point that I played, you don't find like a sword or anything or mm -hmm. switch it out. You really just have this broom the whole time. And sometimes characters like uh, you'll meet a guy and uh, he's, trying to chop down a bush he looks a little bit like link actually and he's like man uh, this is my thing i'm just chopping down this bush what do you got oh a broom and if you try and chop down the bush you'll be like oh you can't use a broom to chop down a bush what are you playing at <laughs> you have to go out and get the master broom and come yeah. back with that yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so the game is just filled with all these just kind of weird characters that I don't know they feel like surreal goofy earthbound characters and they very frequently break the fourth wall and like talk to you as the player huh. and uh i don't know i don't want to give away any more of these weird surprises because like just yeah. the tone of it is was so strange and unexpected uh it's really not like uh uh i don't know like <laughs> typical video game dialogue or characters which has been very cool cool the a lot of the game you spend there's kind of an overworld but um there are a lot of areas which i guess you would call dungeons they're not like classic zelda dungeons where it's like oh go to this temple and get the treasure inside but you will go to some place and inside it will be very maze like and there will be some enemies wandering around and you essentially just have to go and gather um like four collectibles from each dungeon i guess to uh, eventually progress to the next area mm -hmm. but the dungeons have really caught me by surprise because they are um they feel like zelda dungeons if they were a little more kind of maze-like with maybe a slight more emphasis on 
uh, puzzles, but not like not like real brain wrecking puzzles. But um, it's hard for me to compare this to something. I almost feel like uh, did you ever play? There's this um, there's this two D puzzle game called Sokoban. I've not played that. Where you just uh, you essentially just like push boxes around a room. Mm-hmm. Um, that one's like very much a puzzle game. It's not like an adventure game or anything at all. But um, each dungeon in this is, uh, it looks like a Zelda dungeon where it is just a grid of connected square rooms. And in order to get out of that room, you will have to figure out sort of like what the deal is. Like, do you have to flip a switch or do you have to kind of like goad an enemy uh, to go stand on a switch in a corner while you stand on another switch somewhere else? And by doing it at the same time, you will open the door or maybe you have to sweep some dust around with your broom <laughs> are you also doing combat with with the broom is that your there is a little bit of combat but it's very light it's like it's about as involved as the combat was in like zelda one so it's not i mean you wouldn't mistake this for being like an action game but occasionally there is uh there yeah. are enemies you have to deal with <clears throat> yeah you deal with them by whacking them with a broomstick yes yeah um cool Although strangely enough, the bosses are there are bosses and they are they're like much more challenging than just the regular dungeon enemies, which I thought was a little surprising. But uh, so far, it hasn't been incredibly punishing or anything. It's actually been very nice because there are checkpoints all over the place, and if you ever die, it's uh, you know as long as you've been like stepping on every checkpoint, it, you never get pushed too far back. Like you don't lose okay. much progress. Actually, you don't really lose any progress, which is something nice that I realized because I just like made my way very deep into this one dungeon and collected one of the uh, collectible cards that you to get. Uh, and then I just like was getting like playing super sloppy on the way out and died. Uh, and it, I think it was the first time I died in that game. I was like, oh, well, now I have to go back all the way in and get that card again. Uh, but nope, I just respawned in a checkpoint. I checked my inventory. I had the, uh, the card I just collected. And I was like, that's very nice. Oh, yeah. There are a lot of nice little things that uh, a nice little a lot of nice little design choices that just feel very like very supportive of you, the player. Mm-hmm. Like at any time, uh, you can just go to the menu and teleport yourself to the start of the dungeon, or uh, like if you if you're outside of the dungeon in the overworld, you can teleport back to that kind of nexus area, which. Uh, that also has a lot of little teleports to all the different dungeons and other places of interest around the overworld. Cool. So it's pretty easy to get around. Um, and one of my favorite things is in that nexus, you have a little all the little teleport portals, and above each one is a little red gem where if you've collected all the cards and significant items in the area, the gem will just light up. So you know that you're done with that area and you don't spend as much <laughs> time exploring. But I was like, oh my god, it's like. That's really good. I'm so grateful that that is her. Hmm. Because a lot of it is, um, it's definitely kind of more exploration based than a lot of Zelda games. I think you spend a lot of time just kind of wandering. And because you have this map that shows you like a really abstract uh, model of all the rooms and all the, like the exits that take each other rooms, you can kind of look at it and go, oh, well, here's a room with an exit that I haven't taken yet. So I need to go over and check that out. But it really toes the the line of being kind of a, like the world toes the line of being overwhelming and like just small enough to be manageable, if that makes sense, where <laughs> it always feels like, like you'll get to an area and you really want to explore all of it because that's the only way you like find all the collectibles and everything. And um, so far I've, I've managed to do that. Like I've managed to get through every area without getting completely lost, which is uh, a plus, I think. But there are different points where I'll like be kind of wandering around and get somewhere. Uh, I'll get to a new area and go, oh man, this is like, it's a brand new area. What's going on here? And I'll just, like walk one screen over and it'll take me to a, like a totally different brand new area with like another completely separate map. And I just think, okay, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. Which one do I go through first? Um, but despite that, it uh, it has been completely manageable, and uh, I, so far I feel like I am uh, progressing pretty well. I have not really gotten significantly lost throughout the game. Cool. So what is the um, 
I mean, all those things sound uh, interesting and creative, but what has been the hook? You said you heard, um, you read good reviews and people really seem to like it. What was kind of the overarching, um, uh, I don't know, motivator for playing it? Um, you know, I I got into this going on very little. They're <laughs> just like, this game is good. Uh, people should play it. I said, that it's enough for me. It's enough for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm so glad I did. I mean, it's it's very much a, um, I don't know if I want to say it's like a tribute to Zelda, but it's so nice to just play this very simple, kind of very retro game. Um, it reminds me of uh, a few years I talked about a couple of games. One was called, I think, uh, You Have to Win the Game. And then there was a sequel called Super Win the Game. Yeah. Which are both like extremely minimal kind of uh, exploration platformers. Like they didn't have a lot of mechanics, but it was the same kind of deal. You just kind of platformed around this huge map and tried to find, uh, I think like little like signposts or something and pray you didn't get lost along the way. Um, but those were both uh, also very well designed that uh, they were not uh, super challenging. It was just fun to, you know, kick back and explore this weird game world. Um, especially in this, just because every character you run into is so weird, and uh, it's never really sure what's coming up next. Huh. Um, so I'm super cool. into it. Yeah, it sounds interesting. It is only a few hours long. I was really hoping to have it finished up by the time we recorded, but uh, I, I spent a little too much time backtracking in one area, um, and that was my own fault. I did not go back to uh, the Nexus to see if that gem was lit up, and uh, in fact, it was. So <laughs> I just spent a lot of time exploring this one location, looking for something that I'd already collected. <laughs> so uh, I feel like I was a little... <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Well, yep. it's nice, because this game will tell you, like, hey, buddy, look, look at the gem. Keep it moving. Yeah. And it just keeps getting weirder, so that's also fun. Did you know it had a sequel? I did, yeah. It, yeah. The sequel came out very recently, and I'm yeah, last summer. Looking, looking forward to getting it. I think it was like a month ago. Is it really? It was August 12th, 2019. Okay, never mind. Uh, well, anyway. Anyway, yeah. Maybe it just came to Switch recently. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I've, I've not heard of either of these games, so this is... Uh... Uh, or I mean, I think I know the name, but uh, I certainly didn't know what it was about. So cool. Yeah, sounds uh, interesting. Yeah, Most, I think um, it's you know, if you played Breath of the Wild and were one of those people who were like, "Where are all the dungeons in this game? Like, what happened to <laughs> what happened to them?" Uh, this might you know uh, scratch that itch a little bit. Here uh, they are. It's been super fun so far. Uh, uh, cool. I, like, I kind of feel like maybe the plot won't like go anywhere satisfying but i'm kind of okay with it because a lot of the appeal of it is just getting through one of these dungeons and getting all the cards and going to the next weird place so that's been a nice surprise yeah well cool um i uh i don't i I guess i I don't know if it's been surprising (laughs) but um i've been spending a lot of time with gears five that is not surprising that's like the least surprising thing (laughs) i um uh, I generally like a good Gears of War. <clears throat> Excuse me, I like a Gears of War game. I've played them all up to this point. Um, and uh, play Gears yeah. Tactics. No, is that a thing? I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> is that a real thing? I thought. I hope I'm not just making that up. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, anyway. All right. I'll have to go. That didn't have a number. Judgment. Um, so. So yeah, that's that's I can commit to that pretty easily. Um, was that not a? Uh, that was just a separate thing. It was not like secretly Gears Four or anything. I think that was the one that came after Three. Um, but no, it wasn't called Gears Four. Oh. There was a Gears Four, but that wasn't it. That was confusing. It was confusing. So um, so yeah, I uh, I don't know. I don't know why I was. Re- I think uh, I was gonna say I don't know why I was reluctant to get this when it came out last fall. But I think it came out at a time when there were a, p- a ton of other games. Oh, there's so many play. games coming out, and I remember this much more. So Gears waited, um, and uh, um, like a lot of things, I waited so long it kind of fell off my list, and then I re-upped my um, Game Pass because I knew I was going to spend a lot of time at home, and they had a good deal going. I've talked about that a couple weeks ago. Right. And, um, and yeah, I've been, uh, 
uh, sampling the Game Pass a little bit, and Gears is on there. So I've been playing quite a bit of it. Um, I looked at that Game Pass. A lot of Gears are on there. <laughs> There's a ton of Gears of War games in there, yeah. Um, but I... Uh, um, yeah, so Gears of War 5, is, or, or as the game calls it, Gears 5, uh, is um, uh, the one I've not played at all. So I've been playing the... Uh, there's quite a few modes in this. I've been playing the campaign um with uh with our buddy paul uh, as my co-op partner nice um because i'm generally not good enough at a gears game to get through it on my own um <laughs> so when it knocks down the easy or anything um i've done that before i think i played one of them solo or i played judgment solo actually <laughs> on easy um but generally if i can get a friend who wants to go through the like borderlands i've done the same thing with borderlands who wants to go through the campaign with me in its entirety we can kind of keep it on normal or, or whatever mm-hmm. um and uh i can kind of hold my own and until i make a dumb choice and die a lot and <laughs> you then it helps to, have to revive you revive me nice. exactly um so yeah i've been playing the campaign quite a bit with paul and uh actually jumped into um the new horde mode um with um uh, russ greeno one of the guys from our discord uh, yeah. um last week too um and uh horde mode is as it ever was um uh fun i think if i remember correctly gears maybe it was the first game that had a horde mode um and uh it just sends wave after wave of enemies at you um on a pretty tight battlefield uh and you have to work with uh some co-op partners um to uh, keep the bad guys at bay um uh, the new version of Horde had uh, a couple of interesting little hooks in it where you would um, you had to sort of protect these machines in the middle of the battlefield. And if you keep them up and running uh, and by sort of between levels running up to them and, and holding down a button to repair them um, by preventing the enemies from destroying them during the course of a round, um, they would generate energy and you could turn the energy into perks, essentially. Mm. Uh, so you could run back to your base in the 30 seconds you had between Horde rounds um, to build a turret or to build a... A trip mine or to build uh, a little uh, robot that would fly around and shoot enemies <laughs> for a little while. Um, so uh, it was in your best interest to give you these little advantages to keep the machines up and running uh, to generate the energy you needed for these um, these little devastating perks. And that's um, new in this one? I believe so. I, it's been a while since I've done the horde mode. Um, and at some point they all kind of blend together <laughs> in my brain, but hmm. um, I didn't remember what was happening when they first sort of appeared on the battlefield and I was like, Oh guys, if you stand next to it and hold a button, it lets you fix it. <laughs> and then I found the machine that generated the turrets and I was like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm piecing things together here, everyone. <laughs> uh, so, um, we hung in there for a while. It's a uh, horde mode goes for 50 rounds. Oh my God. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Russ and I hung in there, I think 36, 37, um, until my hand hurt so much, <laughs> um, from, um, uh, chainsawing and, and, uh, shooting at enemies, uh, that uh, I just could not hang in there anymore. And we lost all of our co-op partners too. So he and I went in and they matched us with some random folks and eventually all of the random folks dropped out and it was just fairly useless AI partners. Um, and I think he and I were just oh, you mean getting... like they just quit. They just quit. They quit oh, before they hit round fifty. Yeah, um, but um, who does? But we that? had a good time. Yeah, we were strategizing. We were barking orders. <laughs> we were trying to heal each other. Um, and yeah, it was it was kind of uh, you know what I like from Gears is it's sort of that co op uh, chaos that uh, you know bullets flying everywhere, giant monsters stalking you, um, and uh, trying to keep you and your buddies alive for a few more seconds. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, Horde mode uh, was fun. It wasn't a, like a Gears original thing, right? Like maybe I want to say Gears two. I don't know if it was in the first one or not. I don't think it was in the first one, but I believe yeah, I think it came in the second, if I remember correctly. Yeah, because um, that's why yeah. it's Horde mode, right? Because it's like the locusts, right? The locusts are the Horde, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yep. I think it's funny that that this mode has kind of like survived for this long, uh, and it just or that it was be able to become such a thing. Yeah, and no battle royale mode in Gears. <laughs> so I think that, is that has kind of come and gone they, at this point. They didn't embrace that. Um, that might be. Uh, oh, they never did one. I not that I'm aware of. I remember, again, they all sort of blend together in my brain, and I've not uh, necessarily kept up with them to to the level that I kept. I think two and three, I was pretty involved in playing online multiplayer, kind of 
nightly or semi-nightly <laughs> uh, playing horde with friends playing co-op with friends like i remember spending a lot of time with gears two and three mm. um and just you know as you do with anything as i do with anything i i moved on to the next shiny thing and kind of lost track of gears of war um still played the uh campaigns for judgment and four and now five um but uh just did not keep up with that whole online thing as every time i start up gears five now it wants me to buy a pack where it's uh, uh gears five gridiron and it's something football related because there's the football team <laughs> In the universe of Gears of War, there's the one, the Coltrane character that you always play with, mm-hmm. um, is this uh, uh, muscly former football player who is kind of a celebrity in the Gears War world. Um, and uh, anytime he takes down enemies, he says says funny things like, you're all riding the Coltrane and things like that. And so um, uh, apparently they have put that football mode now with whatever that sort of intergalactic version of football is in gears of war now and they want me to buy a pass to play that and play it i think so i don't know it looks like football (laughs) and it says gears 5 gridiron only 30.99 or something like that and i'm like no i'm not giving you more money uh to play that so i i suspect that's what it is based on very little information (laughs) you weren't dying to play this after hearing about it for so long I'm not. No. no, no i don't want to play sports on earth i certainly don't want to play football on I forget where Gears of War takes place. Um, I have no idea. Yep. Didn't they blow up the planet at one point? Omicron per CIA. Oh my of course. Yes. <laughs> um, I think they did blow up the, yeah, they had the Hammer of Dawn, like melted the core of the planet because all the locusts lived underground and mm. there was nothing left. Yeah. I forget what game that was, but because that's the big in in the um campaign for gears five there's like we have to power up the hammer of dawn again and nobody wants to do it because of what happened last yeah, time we so blow up another planet <laughs> let's blow it's up. just like <laughs> can't beat him again i guess you know blow it up we'll go somewhere yes. else <laughs> just blow it up a little this time not not the whole thing guys um but yeah, so um, I, I'm playing through the Gears campaign. It's fun. It's um, uh, it has done some interesting and surprising things. Um, it is less kind of jockey meathead. <laughs> um, the first couple of Gears games were very much for like beefy dudes saying mm-hmm. grisly things to each other and shooting at enemies. Um, and that became iconic. That sort of become kind of the look of a Gears game and the tone of a Gears game. Um, but uh, um, uh, Gears 4, to a certain degree, and now Gears 5 very much so, have been um, – the, the main characters in those games have been kind of the next generation, have been the kids of – um, the folks who uh, who were the leads in the previous Gear games. These games have yeah. spanned generations now. Um, so you have uh, Kate, who is the daughter of of someone from the previous uh, Gears games. You have Dell, uh, who I don't think is the kid of anyone who is a. Um, you have JD, who is uh, Marcus Finiska's son. So they are kind of the the modern um, cogs in this game, and. Um, they're 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 a little funnier. They're a little better written. They're a little more fleshed out. Um, they have more than one uh, speed. Uh, they have more than one emotion, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, they have a lot more kind of interstitial moments of just kind of kind of fun banter and interaction and uh, a little character development um, than I remember there being in in previous Gears games. Um, and just from an aesthetic standpoint, too, um, there's a lot more blue sky in Gears 5 than I ever remember seeing. There's a lot more mm. sort of lush greenery. Um, uh, we just finished a an entire segment um, that took place in like a snow world um, where everything was frozen mm. over and snowstorms came through every now and then. Um, and your mode of getting around in that was a skiff that w- w- one of your players – sort of steered and consulted the map and would like flag things on the on the horizon for you to drive to and the other person would control a um a net (laughs) on a snowboard attached to the back that would catch wind and you could basically drive the skiff around this big open frozen world section um 
and it would put little icons on the map of like, here's the next thing for you to do the next story mission. Um, but we were driving along and, and Paul was like, hey, there's a yellow flag. What is that yellow flag? So we pulled over and kind of got <laughs> out to take a look and we're sort of stomping through the snow and we found like a crashed spaceship and the little screen says secondary objective. You found a secret objective. And oh. I was like, oh, cool. There's secrets in this game. Um so this whole thing has us kind of all over the map, bouncing back and forth between different radio towers, using the little skiff to get around. And of course, every now and then kind of punctuated by, oh shit, there's enemies. Oh crap, there's a giant monster guy who can throw fireballs at you and things like that, uh, as you would expect in a Gears of War game. Um, you know, every now and then we'll go into like, a, oh, we'll find the, the broken down research center and there'll be things that are tipped over that look just about right for cover yeah. uh, height. <laughs> and, uh, oh, here's a couple of boxes of ammo. So everybody load up because we know something is coming. Um, it, it is a Gears of War game. Of course, naturally, it telegraphs those things to you. And those fights are fun. Um, that's what I'm here for a lot of ways, but it has been surprising to see um, how open this game is, how kind of full of secrets it is. Uh, the Gears games historically have been very kind of linear, a, a lot of <laughs> very much sort of, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, and not exaggerating in any way, walking down a hallway, shooting at enemies. Um, and it is uh, um, exciting and invigorating to to s drive the little skiff around the snowy version of, the, of Gears of War, looking for um, hidden secrets and looking for the little red spray paint cog tags that mean um, the little, uh, what you call it, graffiti logos that mean there's a secret buried nearby or looking for the flags that mean there's a um, uh, maybe something hidden in the woods there. And, and so, yeah, that has been surprising. It reminded me a little bit of um, the uh, kind of open world sections of Uncharted 4 where you had the Jeep and you were driving around this big open map um, looking for trouble in a lot of ways. Um, and Gears, of course, exploring and trying to find secrets and occasionally running into firefights. Um, in this section, this snowy section of Gears 5 feels a lot like that. It's just huge and open with a ton of stuff buried uh, kind of just over the hill and you have to kind of suss out all the secrets. And is, is it like that throughout the game? Or is it really just a one section so it far, has been anyway. like that for the one section. It, it started off, uh, the game started off feeling very much like a Gears of War game where you were oh, yeah, a corridor yeah. shooter, um, uh, stomping through uh, a broken down factory trying to find something, um, uh, uh, big city streets, um, uh, and uh, um, yeah, like ships flying over with enemies dropping down and shooting at you uh, and you hiding behind burned out cars and things like that. So a lot of that mm -hmm. feels very like Gears. Got to have um, at least one and, of those levels. Sure. Um, and during that early level, uh, Marcus Phoenix, the star of the previous Gears of War games, is on your like co-op team. He's one of your yeah. NPCs. He's sort of barking orders at you and, and yelling at you and telling you what to do and where to go and what blah, blah, blah. Um, and then um, uh, you get a lead on a thing and two of the characters, Dell and Kate, splinter off. Um, <laughs> incidentally, a black guy and a Native American woman. <laughs> um, and they become the leads of this this movie, essentially. Yeah. Um the, the entire game hinges around them for the next three to four hours as you're skidding around through the snow trying to find and unearth the secrets of what's buried there. Um, That's nice. I remember when yeah. it was like Gears 3 maybe came out. And first of all, they were like, oh, wow, there's color in it now. <laughs> um, but also like, oh, look, there's a woman. Amazing. Because <laughs> yeah. it used to really just be the poster game for gray kind of next gen like dude bro shooters yeah uh so it's refreshing to see that they have uh you know this the progress that they started making uh they've kind of kept up with it since uh Kings yeah three or whenever that was it has definitely grown uh it, it still very much has its kind of foot in that kind of macho dude fantasy of mowing down aliens <laughs> with a giant gun. Um, but uh, I can't fault them for that. That's fun. That's why people play Gears of War in a lot of ways. Um, but within that framework, they've been able to, um, particularly with this game, it feels, um, do things that are more exploratory and less sort of combat uh, driven. Um, that's cool that whole sense of discovery of driving around through the snow and looking for secrets I'm like I can't get over this as a Gears of War game <laughs> um, and there was like a point of no return thing that Paul and I found where we're like okay here's the main objective here's the thing 
kind of buried in the snow that we've been trying to find. We need to make sure we've found every secret yeah. before we went. So we're back on the Do skiff. Every we're sliding quest. around. Yeah. Have we cleaned up everything on the map before we move on to the next thing in Gears of War? And I've that's never been an experience I've had in Gears before. Yeah. Um, so that's exciting. I think it's really, really cool that, again, within the framework of what you would expect from a Gears of War game, it's doing a lot of interesting things with kind of interesting characters uh, and a little more diversity <laughs> than it's ever had before um, that uh, um, kind of push it outside of that uh, um, that macho fantasy that the series started <laughs> with. My, uh, I like hearing you talk about the skiff section and the fact that you are doing two separate things uh, and you're not just running down a corridor. Yeah, because uh, it reminds me. So I only played Gears One out of the whole series, oh. and by far the highlight uh, of that game was there's this one section where you're like separated. I was playing this co-op. I was playing co-op with Paul, incidentally. That's weird. <laughs> um, but one of us was up on a balcony, and there's like a spotlight. You have to shine on the other player who's like running around beneath so they can see what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I was like, this is great. Because, you know, we're doing different things. That, <laughs> like, whenever somebody says, like, oh, there's, like, co-op in this game, you work cooperatively, Yeah, that is, like, kind of what I, mean, I picture. It's usually another character going, help me open this door, yeah, and you both no, stand even, in front of it and push though, X, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. We both have to push this button at the same time. Can, can <laughs> we do it? Can we pull it off? But uh, I thought that was such a cool section. And then it was just that one time no, i think the no. rest of it it was like okay oh now that that's over with get back you know <laughs> running down the hallways like sure huddling behind the wall or whatever so there are a few things like that in gears 5 that i think will that, that have definitely been interesting to me and and you will probably uh find interesting um uh, one of which is that you have sort of a robot sidekick in the early games it was um oh, the floating Jack. thing yeah yeah. Um, and he's a little robot and, um, he basically, he was a tool for you guys to use. He would, um, <laughs> Marcus would say, rip this door, Jack. And he would come out like of, of cloaking with a blowtorch and would open up a door that would move you to the next section. And that was kind of the only time that you really saw Jack. Um, in Gears 5, you can have a third player that controls Jack. Um, and he will open doors. He can go get, um, uh, what you call it, pick up weapons for you that are on, on unreachable places in the battlefield. Mm. Uh, he can pick up boxes of ammo for you and bring them back. Um, he, um, has a couple of other abilities too. He has an electro field where he can shock enemies that will kind of freeze them in place as they kind of vibrate and you can take shots at them. Um, and um, what else? He can blind them. <laughs> and these are things that are upgradable. So you'll find little um, microchips throughout. As you're exploring, you'll find little microchips that you can put in Jack that essentially open up a skill tree in him that allow you to level up those abilities. Um, so if you don't have a person, a, a real human person controlling Jack, um, uh, it just sort of does it on autopilot in a lot of ways, or you can point at things and tap X um, and Jack will go, you know, bring me that gun, Jack, bring me that ammo box, Jack. Um, and one of the players uh, will level him up. But if you have a third person who's controlling Jack, he controls all of that stuff. Um, mm. And you can sort of bark orders to your friend who is controlling Jack. I need a gun. I'm down over actually later in the game. If you get like down, five people. Jack can revive you, which is super useful. Um, it's kind of interesting. Is that yeah. just like, um, you can't do uh, – it doesn't sound like a full third-player role, right? Because it kind of caps out at two players when you're doing co-op. It's two players who play humans that could run around with guns. Um, mm -hmm. And a third person can control Jack throughout the entire game. Hmm. It's kind of um, interesting. But you, you don't have a combat role. You're not actually shooting at enemies or hiding behind cover or anything like that. I mean, it sounds um, like uh... – it sounds like they just – like previous games, you've been able to do four-player co-op, right? Or is that what yeah. I'm thinking? Halo or something? Oh, no. You could uh, – um, the previous secure games, uh, I think, primarily were all four-player co-op. Oh. Hmm. It's weird. I wonder if they just couldn't, like, couldn't coax it out of the Xbox this time or – I don't know. <laughs> I Googled it. One of the producers said that to, to be able to continue supporting four-player co-op, you have to have four characters on the screen at all times. Um, and the story that we were trying to tell primarily focused on Kate and Dell. Um, oh, interesting. So we didn't want to kind of fall all over ourselves to create scenarios where they always had two other people with them. Um, you could um, just but they have could like obviously red and blue create... following you around. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, clones or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was necessarily about horsepower, but more about kind of the story they wanted to tell. At least that's what mm. the producers say. Okay. I've... <laughs> 
not sure if I completely buy that, but sure. <laughs> it sounds like PR, of course, but yeah. Um, oh, you know, it would interfere with our our creative vision for Gears sure. of War. Um, the other um, thing that I think is kind of interesting, though. yeah. Uh, on top of that, is that Kate um, uh, has uh, like horrible migraine headaches um, that are prompted by something in the game. I won't go into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when Kate has a migraine attack, she can't play. Um, she her vision is shaky and and she kind of falls over and writhes in pain. Um, and Paul is playing as Kate. And I'm playing as Dell, her backup. Uh, and he's like, "Oh no, here comes a headache!" <laughs> and he's out. He falls down, writhes in pain. All he sees is just a screen blackout essentially. And I have to keep fighting mm-hmm. and kind of protect him while this thing passes. Um, I thought that was kind of neat. I don't know. I, I remember fun. another Gears game where they've taken a character out of the play and made you sort of fight for them. Um, there's also an enemy that's kind of gross and creepy <laughs> that skitters around on legs and its belly opens up and like tentacles come out and will grab you and nope. pull you into its belly. Um, and then it tries to take you away. It will carry you away to some remote part of the map. Um, and while you're swallowed up in, in its belly, all you see is like blackout. You see <laughs> red and black and you can't do anything. You It doesn't even sort of give you like a press X to escape or anything like that. You really just have to like hope your friends come find you. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> and they just like, oh, well, we're so close to the end of the level. Let's just do it. We'll just forget <laughs> that guy. Just let him go. Um, so uh, it, it again, it, I think it, it's certainly probably not as fun as the spotlight thing that you're talking about, but it does kind of create a couple little mm. scenarios where the players are doing things that are different from each other um, and kind of supporting each other in ways that are a little more surprising. Mm-hmm. I just thought that, you know, it's it has such a reputation for being like a, a fun co-op like buddy game yeah and yet most of the time it's just you know second players that are shooting stuff with you which is like nothing wrong with that and they they do it very well but i just thought man that that one sequence was just elevated above the, the rest of the game by so much i thought there's <laughs> so much more opportunity there for them to do like yeah maybe not an entire game where it's just one co-op set piece after another but you know, it should be like a focus. It should be like a signature of the Gears of War game. Like what crazy situations are these guys going to get themselves <laughs> into to the point where they're just like, oh man, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> just finding yeah. excuses for one guy to like slip off a ledge and have to take another route through the level or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, that was in one of the Gears games where it would, uh, and I think it happened a couple of times, it would split the party. Mm-hmm. You would get like, um, two of the characters would kind of go low, and the other two would go high, and you guys would meet yeah. up on the other side. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think so they did you... that in Gears 1, for sure. Hmm. So, yeah, but you know, that's the... like, that's not contrived enough for me. I need them, one one guy to be like, <laughs> in the sidecar, and the other guy's driving a motorcycle, <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Then you would really like driving around in the skiff. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Think no, that sounds a, great. I want to do yeah, that. It's a ton of fun. I really, really like that a lot. And and uh, um, at the end of the the snow section, Dell said, uh, like you, a rescue ship comes and picks you guys up from the Antarctic or wherever you are. Um, and he's like, I want to take this home with me. Attach it to the ship. And I'm like, Yes, there's going to be more skiff somewhere. <laughs> so I don't oh. know where we're going to drive that thing around. Uh, but they made a point of getting a line of dialogue in there that was like, Hook it up to the ship. We're taking it home. Nice. Uh, I. I can only assume that means I'm going to get to drive it around somewhere else later. (laughs) See, I just want to be the skiff driver. I will come pick you guys up and take you wherever. You You just want to be the chauffeur? (laughs) Yeah. You guys can go shoot stuff. I'll just hang back in the skiff. (laughs) Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That'd Uh, be fun. My favorite, uh, man, like one of my favorite co-op segments in a game ever is going to be in uh, Lost Planet 2, which was basically Japan trying to make a Gears of War game. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was like I think it was on stage three. You got on this huge train, uh, which incidentally has an enormous cannon on the front of it, and uh, a huge boss appeared because you just fought enormous insects or whatever in that game. I remember that. Game. And uh, in order to kill the thing, it was like uh, it was a team effort because you had this huge cannon. Somebody had to be sitting in the like <laughs> it was like a driver's seat for this cannon. <laughs> Uh, so they had to like aim it and fire it, and meanwhile, your the rest of your team was like loading these like shells the size of refrigerators onto a conveyor belt and like charging them up. And meanwhile, like smaller bugs are attacking the trains. You have to fend them off. But it was uh, it was a whole like 
it was incredible and i just thought <laughs> man, it sounds like a good why time are there more games like this yeah why are yeah. there more games where you just have to be a crew and and man <laughs> like a giant train cannon yeah and you all have you sort of well and gears doesn't necessarily like have a class se- se- uh, uh, system so it's not like one character is like the heavy and another one is the sniper or the yeah. medic that's um, surprising so you- actually they've never done that not that I'm I mean, aware I, of. I guess you kind of do it on the fly because like, you can pick up whatever weapons are lying around, right? Well, especially we, we improvise those things where – because the, the the layout of kind of the, the fight arenas essentially lends itself to like, well, I, I have a sniper rifle, so I'm going to climb this ladder and try to get a high spot. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you take out the scrubs below uh, and try not to die uh, because we won't be anywhere near each other. Um, so, so yeah, those things kind of evolve, but it's not kind of baked into the um, – the what the 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 classing uh, mm-hmm. classifications of the game like it does in um uh borderlands um where you have you know uh, somebody's the heavy and somebody is the yeah um i don't know what the other classes <laughs> in borderlands are anymore but i remember there being a big guy yeah and he was the one who would go in and just punch everybody while you kind of shot from by, from behind yeah well maybe that's nice that it's not kind of hard coded in because it lets you mix it up a little bit like yeah. you know you, you're like striker or whoever the the point man gets taken out and the only guy left is the sniper that's not great always but uh yeah. man just think if you have to pick a distinct character every time you went to, into a co-op game and this that would be kind of different <laughs> it, would, it would be maybe that's coming i don't know but um yeah I've had fun with it. I mean, it clearly, probably you can tell from my tone of voice and my level of enthusiasm here. Uh, it's been a good time playing Gears of War Five. I, um, uh, I, I don't know. I'm I'm glad I got around to it, and uh, I'm glad you know someone. And it's not uh, Epic anymore. I forget who the developer is now. Oh, they've got their own studio, right? Isn't it like uh, like the Halo guys? I mean, not not the Halo guys, but there's a separate Halo studio that just makes this right. Games. Yeah, yeah, um, but um, but yeah, they're 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 mixing it up a little bit, kind of doing new and interesting things, and and kind of keeping uh, gears um, relevant, which is <laughs> probably got to be a battle for uh, a, a game in a series that is kind of as aged and uh, iconic as it is. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard good things about this one. Uh, I'm kind of curious about it. I might do the Game Pass thing. Yeah. Uh, and just to correct yeah. myself, I, l- I looked it up, and Gears Tactics does exist, but it's not out yet. That surprised oh. me. It's out, like, next week. Oh, interesting. Um, so I'll be eager to hear the how that is. <laughs> I'll have to look into that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm assuming, just based on the title, that it's a tactical game. <laughs> but <laughs> That would uh, yep. that'd be very misleading if it wasn't. <laughs> what uh, what what stripe of it? What version is it? Is it Fire Emblem meets Gears of War? Is that oh, I hope so. I hope you're just yeah. having a tea party with Marcus Phoenix between levels. <laughs> oh, what a lovely tea party! <laughs> hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Good times. So, if anybody wants to play Gears, uh, I'm here for you guys. Nice. <laughs> yeah. First night playing co-op, though, you have to play as the robot. <laughs> we have to audition you as as the robot. Yeah. Well, cool. Glad yeah. Gears is doing well. That's <clears throat> staying relevant. Yeah. I've not kept up with Halo, so I don't know if that series has aged well. Um, yeah, but uh, the last few have been very well received. And the, yeah. the latest one is just taking forever to come out, so who knows what's going on. And there's always Ge- Gears of War waiting for you. <laughs> True. Yeah. I mean, that first time in any Gears game where you get the the Lancer, kind of that iconic Gears of War gun that has the chainsaw attached to the front of it, um, and you're like, how do you do the chainsaw again? And you find out, and you run up to that first enemy, and you and just rip his chest open with the chainsaw. It's a good time. <laughs> it reminds me, like, oh, that feels really good when you do that in a video game. Um, yeah. The whole controller shakes, and it makes a ton of noise, and blood splatters everywhere, and the enemy rides, of course, and it's a good it's a good time it's very gears very gears moment oh absolutely yeah yeah and there's robots in this game so you can you take the chains out of the robot and it just rips them open and gears fly all over the place and sparks fly i'm like oh that's interesting um so yeah it's uh it's good it's, um, i'm glad it's a thing that still exists nice speaking of things that still exist yeah uh what is this game called i get it wrong every time big <laughs> wide big ocean, ocean big wide jacket wide jacket wide ocean nope it is actually called wide ocean big jacket got it yep i had to think about it for a second 
<laughs> it could make sense. The ocean could either be wide or big. It could be. But the jacket, probably big. You don't really, <laughs> like, wide jackets are not really a thing. Yeah. So I get there eventually. Big and tall jackets. Yeah. Wide ocean, tall jacket. <laughs> Short skirt. Tall, long Tall jacket. ocean, long jacket. <laughs> Any just, like, plenty of possibilities for the sequel. Yep. Yeah. So if you're still listening, the game is actually called <laughs> Wide Ocean Big Jacket. Um, and this is one of the um, – and we've talked – I've talked a bit about this in the uh, show in the past. The, the Verge does this sort of occasional series of single-sitting games, essentially a game that you can kind of get through um, in a couple of hours, uh, things that are a little more kind of focused and tight and concise um, in, in our busy lives. Um, my life's not so busy right now, but in my – in generally in my busy life, it's tough to see a game through to the very end. Um, um, so the point of this Verge series has been to kind of call out games that you can sort of get a sense of completion uh, from playing all the way through. Um, and uh, Wide Ocean Big Jacket was their most recent kind of recommendation, and uh, the description of it sounded really interesting. I said, DJ, let's play this game, uh, and that brought us up to this point. And now we're here. Yes. Um, so it is. It's pretty concise. You can kind of get through the whole thing in not a lot of time. Um, I ended up playing it across two sessions, but it's got to be less than an hour and a half, right? I think, yeah, I think I got through the whole thing in like an hour. Okay. I was like, you, you told me about this game. Uh, I think I read the same Verge thing that said it was like 45 minutes. So one weekend I was like, I'm just going to play this in bed in the morning before I've even done anything. <laughs> uh, and that'll be nice. Uh, so yeah. I did. Hey. Um, how would you describe it? Uh, that's a little trickier. Uh, I think, yeah. I don't know if it was you who described it to me this way, but you said it reminded you of Virginia. Not the state of Virginia, but there was a game. <laughs> the game out. Virginia, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I remember why. I think it was like, maybe The Verge did this, but they compared The Verge it, made that comparison as well, yeah. They compared it to Virginia because it, um, like, it's a very narrative-heavy game. It's almost like watching a movie. Um, but it makes a lot of kind of cinematic style cuts from scene to scene so it's not mm -hmm. necessarily just one continuous um you don't follow a character through every single scene back to back like you would in like another video game perhaps right yeah sometimes you are different characters sometimes you're not a character at all you're just um you're just a camera in a lot of ways yeah. um it does the thing that that 70s show did when they were all sitting around smoking weed um where it was like a camera in the middle of the table and it would spin around and focus on each character as they were sort of talking and getting high um wide ocean big jacket does that quite a bit where you kind of control the camera and you essentially spin around people sitting in a car or at a campfire um and tap on each of them to sort of prompt them to the next sort of line of dialogue and interaction mm -hmm. um so you're kind of directing the game in a lot of ways you're not necessarily kind of playing it in the traditional sense yeah and even then i'd say like you're not so much like directing it as in you're making choices you're just kind of right I don't know. It, it feels like you do have options at certain times, but it, it, you don't have like a, a an impact on what's unfolding, really. Yeah, there's no dialogue trees or <laughs> a good ending or a bad ending or anything like that. You're you're not really. It doesn't feel like you're impacting the story in, in any kind of tangible way like that. Yeah. So in that sense, it's, it's not. Very a, it's much not a like telltale Virginia. game. Yeah. Right, because Virginia kind of had a story to tell. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was kind of one pathway through that. Uh, and a lot of what you did in Virginia was just sort of prompt the game through those beats. Yeah. Um, so on this one, you are mm -hmm. a family, sort of. Would you say, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say you're like, <laughs> you're like any of them, but it follows this uh, this group of people that's like a girl and her like sort of boyfriend and then her aunt that's her aunt and uncle is that correct correct yep her aunt uh, and uncle. yeah and they're going on a camping trip which is uh what a delightful premise <laughs> being able to go outside with people <laughs> yeah um and it's just a you know a very just pleasant and wholesome kind of self-contained story for about 45 minutes yeah and um the lead character Mord, M O R D. It's an unusual name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, terrific. I was just like, yep. I don't understand why that's her name, but it's good. And her aunt's name is Cloanne, which Clo is a yeah. weird. Yep. Um, but uh, Mord uh, is 13 years old, and she has, like you said, kind of this best friend 
maybe she has feelings for maybe her boyfriend his name is ben um but they've been friends for a very long time um and they're kind of becoming a little bit older and a little more interested in each other and a little more interested in each, yeah in each other i guess and um uh, uh yeah so they are kind of exploring the world kind of not necessarily as kids anymore but a little bit more as kind of adults um and it bounces between their interactions and the aunt and uncle um, who are a little later in life, uh, who have never had kids, who are not accustomed to taking care of kids, let alone teenagers, um, and their kind of interactions with each other. Um, and the game creates little scenarios where different characters of these four kind of interact with each other in different ways. Um, and it's, yeah, more dialogue-driven, more character-driven, um, but it's not really... Um, a choose your own adventure <laughs> you're not yeah. uh like you said you're not necessarily kind of doing um the big work of of guiding the game to a specific um ending or finale you're not trying to sort of geez i hope i can get this character to uh, kiss the other character you're not you're not driving that ship at all <laughs> it's going to happen whether or not you have any impact on it yeah yeah and uh for the most part it's very light like there's not uh even with that sort of premise in mind with maybe like all this tension potentially between these characters it it's mostly just like goofy like side conversations like you might have on a camping yeah. trip it's uh, funny though i yeah. think there's some really funny writing <laughs> i i had a couple of genuine laugh out louds um uh, yeah it's not a side splitter but there is some very funny writing in it um mord is an oddball <laughs> yeah uh and a bit of a spaz um so she talks a lot uh and yeah she's funny like she's uh you know i can identify with that yeah it took me a little bit it took me a little while to get into it uh as I, was, I went into this expecting something very similar to virginia which is this like not really at all first of all there's a yeah like you said a lot of dialogue um virginia has no dialogue no yeah. no dialogue yeah which is which is cool in its own right but uh yep. no very very different uh tonally also extremely different very silly uh i was worried it might tread into like frog detective territory which uh <laughs> was didn't really click with me but for the most part uh i i enjoyed it i was, <laughs> I was able to put up with mord's antics <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a um, it's a weird game to sort of recommend because uh, I, I liked it, so I could recommend it based on that. I enjoyed the time I spent with it. I'm glad it was as short as it was. If this was nine hours long, or if it was, um, you know, tune in next week for the next chapter in Wide Ocean Big Jet, like that would not have appealed to me at all. I think it told its sort of super concise story mm -hmm. within its time frame, and when it was done, I was sort of like, oh, that was pleasant, um, but. Um, it doesn't necessarily push the same buttons as a kind of traditional video game experience. And of course, I say that knowing full well that that's a bullshit statement. And there's a, a billion things that go under the umbrella of a video game experience. But it, like, like we've said throughout, you're not necessarily having an impact on this world. You're not driving these characters. Um, this story happens. In a lot of ways, you could, uh, if, if you didn't have to push X just to make everybody talk to each other all the time, it could sort of continue to play out like a movie um, or an episode of a TV show. Yeah. Um, it isn't necessarily uh, a gaming experience where you have a lot of impact on what's going on on the screen. Yeah. And I suspect as a gamer, hearing me describe it that way, you probably know whether or not this would be something that would appeal to you. <laughs> yeah, I think there are a lot of similar um, yeah. uh, kind of quote-unquote video game experiences that you could uh, compare this to, other than Virginia even. Sure. I came away from it initially a little... I felt like I was disappointed. I don't know why exactly, but I just felt like, you know, it's just a quick thing. It's The, the conversations were entertaining. It doesn't really... I don't know. I don't know if there was like a huge message behind it or anything. Yeah, it doesn't really say anything. Yeah. But, so I was like, wow, oh, that was lame. But the more I thought <laughs> about it, the, uh, I ended up thinking about it some more and just reflecting back on uh, just like the types of conversations they were having and stuff they were talking about. Don't, don't want to give any spoilers or anything, but just sort of the way uh, I don't know, like the, just the, the all the conversations felt very natural 
Mm-hmm. And like the way you would talk about stuff on a camping trip. Because there are like kind of big issues that the game gets into a little bit, but they don't really explore them a whole lot. And I was like, well, yeah. they didn't really like this game didn't go anywhere. What's the problem? But like you wouldn't really do that on a camping trip. You wouldn't go out in the woods <laughs> and be like, now is the time to address this issue. <laughs> Let's just do it. Yeah. I think uh, one of the characters says that actually when Mord sort of lays something kind of heavy on her aunt, her aunt goes, okay, well, I wasn't really expecting to get into that on a camping trip. But <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and I thought, you know, it was actually very like thoughtfully constructed and there are some, uh, some very insightful things said. Um, so eventually I came around to, on it and I was like, okay, that was, <laughs> it was actually pretty good. <laughs> I don't know why I had that initial reaction. Uh, I was disappointed in myself. But uh, I think it was cool. I would totally play uh, another thing like this. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, um, yeah, I think I play so many games where it's sort of like manipulating all of the elements of the game, trying to sort of get to one of seven different endings or get the good ending or the bad ending. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Wide Ocean Big Jacket takes a very decisive narrative approach. Um, this is the story. These are the characters. Uh, we're all going to arrive at the same finish line, no matter what uh, you do all the way on the way there. Um, and um, it tells its story. Uh, and I don't know enough about the developers or the people that behind this thing to know whether or not it's a personal thing or if it's just a narrative they constructed, if it's meant to be something from their lives. Uh, maybe that's kind of irrelevant, but um, it's... It is interesting to me that we've gotten to a point in gaming, and we've been here for a little while, where where I think this is a two-party development team can do something that is personal like this, that is narrative and character-driven like this, um, and it doesn't have to have, um, you know, I don't know, a skill tree and yeah. uh, a codex and uh, a level no up for your system. weapons. No crafting. Yeah, exactly. That it can just be you this. Just, oh, you uh, do build a tent, though. I don't know about that. You do, you do, yep. And you break it down at the end, too, before you pack up the car. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a story to tell. Um, yeah. Yeah. Glad it's out there. Yeah, absolutely. So, again, that was Wide Ocean Big Jacket. Correct. And, um, that name will not make any more sense to you once you've played the game. <laughs> no, not really. Because <laughs> I was, I was hoping for some explanation. I got none. Yeah, yep. there is a wide ocean. Uh, I believe <laughs> there, there is. is a jacket at some point, um, but uh, it's yeah. not incredibly important. Yeah. Either that, or it just uh, so went the- completely over my head, which is, uh, <laughs> I don't, I'm completely open to that possibility. Sure, you were half asleep at the time. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, well, maybe I didn't even finish this thing. <laughs> Um, but this is available on the Switch. Uh, it's on PC as well. You can play it on Steam or uh, you can get it from itch.io. It's only nice. seven bucks, eight bucks, I think. Um, uh, uh, you have to decide whether or not that's worth it to you. <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I thought it was a fun story. Uh, interesting characters. Yeah. Uh, I would encourage folks to check it out if you think this would appeal to you. I uh, Yeah, I highly recommend it. I really do just want Virginia 2, though. When is that happening? I don't know. Not the actual game that Studio is making, because that looks horrible. But I just want another, like, Virginia Episode 2 or whatever. What game are they making? They're making... It's like uh, it's like all in 3D and people talk in it. And it's like, that's not what I want anymore. <laughs> Oh man, now that I'm friends with my Xbox again, I should play Virginia again. You should. I always like I should play that. <laughs> it's tough because it's like 3 hours long and once you start, you can't really stop it. So, it's a roller coaster. Yeah, you really just have to kind of sit with it. Yeah. Uh-oh. But uh hmm. man, I listen to that soundtrack all the time. It's terrific. Cool. Uh maybe that's the way to go. I'll just listen to the soundtrack. Uh not a bad choice. All right. Well, we should wrap this thing up uh should we yes so. probably should i got nothing else is that that's the whole list right no that's it that's all the video games um if you need any more video game hangover in your brain follow us on twitter at twitter.com slash vg hangover or head to our blog at vghangover.com 
Uh, also, you should hop into our Discord, hang out with us, um, talk about games, play games. We've been getting together uh, once a week or so to play um, Cards Against Humanity or Jackbox games or stuff like that. Uh, Gears of War when I can make people play it with me. Um, <laughs> so uh, definitely hop into our Discord and uh, uh, hang out with us one night. Play this week we're going to play um, we're going to play Fibbage, I think. So nice. Um, yeah, if you want to do that, just hop into our Discord for the deets. Sell me some turnips. Oh, no, no, no. Let me sell you turnips. <laughs> Buy my turnips. I bought exactly. some turnips this week. Yeah. I'm already kind of regretting it because now I'm just like, one more thing I have to do this week or else I'm bankrupt forever. Riding that roller coaster, DJ. Yeah. So this is like exactly what I'm talking about. I was like, I didn't want to get back into this turnip thing. <laughs> but here I am. You're in the turnip mafia now. Yeah. Mm. All right, we'll be back next week. DJ will let us know how his turnip venture went. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, until then, this is Randy Dickinson. This is DJ Ross. Thanks for listening to Video Game Hangover. Goodbye. Good night. See ya. See ya.